Petros, good morning. Thanks for joining us. How are you? Good morning to you, Dan, and the Danettes. How are you guys? We're, I'm great out here in L.A. All right. How's morale in Los Angeles? If you were recapping the last couple of days football-wise, how would you sum it up? Morale is kind of like a family at a table at a restaurant that just got into a yelling match in front of a whole bunch of strangers. It's a, it's a little bit awkward. I, I don't really... I don't really know how to gauge what happened in the last couple of days because for 20 years we sat around 20 plus and went through every envi- environmental report, every <laughs> stupid thing that you hear when we talk about relocation, all those words that sportscasters use that they learn in business class and in graduate school. And there was nothing, you know, we were just spinning our wheels. And then all of a sudden within the span of like 13 months, we have two NFL teams, and the real crazy part of it is the most popular team in L.A. is the Raiders. <laughs> They're not the one that, that's coming here. So it is a little awkward, but at the same time, for us media types, it's very interesting because we have breaking news to cover and to freak out about and talk about logos and all that. But is is San Diego are the Chargers sort of forcing their way in like we're here so deal with us is is does LA care that the Chargers are in town I I don't think outwardly right now they do now there are some interesting nuances to this and you understand the NFL very well you know San Diego is its own market it's its own place it has its own unique identity It doesn't want to be associated with L.A. Mm -hmm. Its only real association with Los Angeles is that it's also in Southern California. So the Chargers have nothing to do with Los Angeles, and nobody really feels connected to them. But the intriguing part of playing at the former Home Depot Center, now the StubHub Center, that only has 30,000 seats, is going to feel a little bit like old Keysar Stadium or something like that. And those seats will go at a premium and they have a good quarterback, and they have a new coach, so maybe they can sell that. And maybe the thing that trumps the fact that the Rams lost a lot of interest in town shortly after the preseason and the fact that nobody cares about the Chargers, maybe the stadium, Dan, maybe that Taj Mahal, uh, Dallas type of place, or the place like in Arlington, maybe that erases all of this and it becomes a big attraction in town. But right now there's just a bunch of question marks. Speaking of which, what did you think of the uh, the new logo for the Chargers? You know, people really uh, people really attacked it. Yes, they did, <laughs> and so did I. <laughs> it, yeah, it, it, the best. I, I don't know if they gave it that much thought, Petros. It feels like they went, "Oh, we got to have a logo here. <laughs> How about we just do a banette at the end of the Dodgers logo? Yeah, that'll be like a lightning bolt. Yeah, that'll do it. Here we go." Yeah, what I thought it looked like is what somebody tweeted me I thought was the most appropriate. It looked like my whole high school career, you know, copying somebody's homework but trying not to make it look exactly <laughs> like their homework, just, you know, throwing a little nuance on it here or there, getting a couple wrong just to throw the teacher off. But then all of a sudden the Spanos family backpedaled on the radio yesterday saying, no, 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 that's not our permanent label. That was just a – like a holding label, mm. and I don't know what I mean. A lot of people are smarter than me, but I don't know what a holding label is. To me, you put out your logo, that's your logo. But I think they got so much backlash that they uh, that they're backlash they're, that they're backpedaling. But at the same time, the Clippers could have done the same on Chuck the Condor, but they stuck with their guns. I also wanted to ask you about this because you played college football at USC. When you have a head coach who is younger than you. How do you think this plays? How long does this play, or is this an issue with the Rams that Sean McVay is 30 years of age? You know, I don't know him uh, like uh, like I know some coaches here and there, but when a guy's 30 years old, it makes you think, well, who hired him? And the guy that hired him is a young guy that's coming into a lot of question, Kevin Demoff, uh, the guy that hired Jeff Fisher, mm-hmm. the guy that fired uh, Jeff Fisher, the guy that allowed Jeff Fisher – to hire a novice offensive coordinator to help out a rookie quarterback, learn to take snaps under center. So there's a lot of missteps here. And it looks like a young guy hiring somebody that he can control as opposed to hiring a coach that's just going to come in and and take the lion's share of the responsibility of of building the team and, and doing that 
sort of stuff. To be honest, it kind of reminds me, you mentioned college football, of the situation when Lane Kiffin was hired by Mike Garrett at USC after the Pete Carroll departure to Seattle, which was, hey, uh, we're hiring this young guy who's inexperienced and this and that, but he's going to bring his dad and he's going to bring Ed Ogeron. And that's kind of what's happening here with McVay. They're saying, well, we're bringing this young guy in, but he's bringing the gray head Wade Phillips, and he's going to provide the stability. Well, they already had a defensive Super Bowl winning coach uh, in Greg Williams. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it, it, there's still a, just a lot of uh, a lot to be desired about the management of the Rams since they came to Los Angeles. How would you grade Jared Goff's first year? I'd give him a D. I guess, you know, I, I, it's not his fault to be, to be completely frank. He had uh, a, not a, not a high grade offensive coordinator, or at least that was considered to be that in Boris Wanky w- was not coming out of uh, a lot of NFL experience as a coach. And then all of a sudden, you know, here's a guy from one of those sunny Dykes types of offenses where you're taking shotgun snaps and, you know, doing a lot of play action with, zone read stuff and all of a sudden you want him to look down the field and, and read progression and play in a pro style offense to me i didn't think he wasn't a prospect i mean the guy has a talented arm we saw him a bunch on the west coast but why give up all those picks and take him at number one you put yourself behind the eight ball because he looks like a, a baby giraffe under center i mean his <laughs> he doesn't have the muscles in his ass you know he doesn't have the muscles in his legs to drop back and look like a man yet and when that's the number one pick in the draft, that, that's a bad look. So they needed to hire a savvy, barnacle-filled offensive coordinator <laughs> last year to work with him. And, and they didn't. And we'll see what they do uh, with this young guy. But he's got a 30-year-old that's in charge that looks like Sean from The Bachelor. Well, we thought that he might be um, a Gosling type. Uh, I mean, you got you, who's better looking, the coach or the quarterback? Ah, you know, I'm going to say the coach has a little bit of A.J. Hawk in him. You know, it looks like somebody hit him right in the red between the <laughs> eyes with a, with a big pugilist stick, you know, so he's got that bruise. Goff is, <laughs> Goff's from Marin, you know. Goff is from uh, Marin Catholic. He's pretty, you know. He's from the Bay Area <laughs> and not just the Bay Area, you know. He's from where, where, uh, where Huey people. Lewis and the Grateful Dead, yeah, was. <laughs> He's where Sean Penn used to live with Robin Wright, where they used to put it down. So he's special. <laughs> Good to talk to you, Petros. Tell money we said hello. Always nice to be on. Thanks for having me. Whenever I come on the show, I get a bunch of texts that say, you better not screw up. This is a big <laughs> opportunity. Don't look like an idiot. Are you, in, are you in Seton? Is the show in Seton? Are you guys on good terms, uh, Seton and, and money? You know, I'd like to feel everything's clean in 2017. Seton, you know, is that right? Up new. Seton, is that uh, where you stand with uh, money? Man, you know what? That's such old news. I don't even remember what you're talking about. That's water under the bridge. We're all good. We've all hugged it out many times. I, I still go back to that Super Bowl party where you had a Budweiser in your hand, and next thing I know, it was almost mm. go time between <laughs> Seton and, and money. How would that have played out, Seton against money? Gosh, you know, I never seen Matt in a fight, but he had a little more weight to him back then. You know, now he's run a bunch of marathons oh. and he's real skinny. Yeah, uh, Seton's, Seton's not. It would have been it, it would have been a radio war. I mean, there's no doubt about it. <laughs> it, it not since Man Cal versus Howard Stern wow. has been such a radio clash. <laughs> yes, Seton. Two dudes in skinny jeans yeah. yelling at each other. Yeah, holding <laughs> Budweisers. <laughs> eh, it's yeah. not really the o- toughest. Over one. the arcade fire. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Petros, thanks for joining us. Uh, have a good weekend. Thank you. All right, guys. Fight on. That's uh, Petros Papadakis, co host of Petros and Money on AM 570 LA Sports. The Dan Patrick Show, weekday mornings on Audience.